Hey y'all, I am Braylon Lombard, the founder of Unjaded Curations, a creative house that conceptualizes, curates, and produces art experiences beyond the gallery. Unjaded is founded on the principles of inquiry-based learning and radical imagination. We encourage viewers to become participants in artistic storytelling and to create what should exist. Unjaded Curations has the honor of guest curating the 2022 Black Art Story Month. We are featuring Democracy's Body, an ode to Black women reimagining the position and voice of American democracy. Black Art Story Month is a month-long series with a visual exhibition along Myrtle Avenue produced by Myrtle Avenue Brooklyn Partnerships with the support of Tank House. This year, we were able to partner with the amazing team at Bricks Art Media to have a div digital conversation with two emerging artists to discuss the unapologetic influence and voice of Black women in visual storytelling. Brick is a leading arts and media institution anchored in downtown Brooklyn, whose work spans contemporary visual and performing arts, media, and civic action. For over 40 years, Brick has shaped Brooklyn's cultural and media landscape by presenting and incubating artists, creators, students, and media makers. Brick centralizes voices that take risks and drive culture forward and acts as a creative catalyst for the community. Before hopping into our conversation, we have to take a deep dive into the history and meaning of this title. Why did we include Gold Front and how are we making this connection to Black Art Story Month? In awe of people's obsession with grills, um, Issa Rae did her last interview with Gail in one and we stand, we love it. It's given me lots of questions about how we adorn ourselves and decorate ourselves and how these, the, these, these methods are connected to the stories we tell. And this one is just so personal. So we are going to connect the swag and status of grills to the agency and power of imagery controlled by Black women in visual storytelling. We have a big question that we are going to focus on today. And that big question is, how does the agency and influence of black women in visual storytelling connect to the history of gold fronts. In order for us to answer this question, we have to deconstruct it and put it back together. We have a few key terms that we're gonna focus in on. The first key term is agency. We are grounding ourselves in this definition of agency that comes from neuroscientist Mathis Sinofik. He conducted a study on understanding the difference between agency and ownership and how these terms show up in the way a person or group of people process their own actions and how those actions are, are in response to other people. So he defines agency into two points. He says one is a feeling of agency, which is lower level, it's non-conceptual. It's kind of the background buzz of control, you know, our voluntary actions that are not, when we are not explicitly thinking about them. But then he has another um, um, area of agency where he says a judgment of agency, which is a higher level conceptual judgment of choice and it arises in situations where we make explicit attributions of agency to the self or for other people. So for example, the decision of comparing black women to gold fronts is a judgment of agency I am deciding to make. It is intentional for the sake of analyzing black women's intentional choices in visual storytelling. So when we rephrase our big question, what we're really trying to figure out is in what ways does the intentionality of black women's choices in visual storytelling, how does this relate to the history of gold fronts? In order for us to answer that question, we have to look at the history of gold fronts. Historians saw the first sign of gold fronts coming out of Italy and out of Tuscany to be exact. So around 800 to 200 BC, 
archaeologists believe rich Etruscan women were the first to wear laced gold teeth. According to Joseph Becker in The Golden Smile, The Etruscans and the History of Dentistry, women would purposely remove their teeth to flaunt their status and often went to a goldsmith, not a dentist. They went to a goldsmith to do so. But once the Roman Empire conquered much of Italy and Tuscany included, this cultural practice and form of expression was averted. We see this same thing happen in 300 AD to 900 AD with Mayan kings and queens. They would drill holes into their upper, upper teeth and fill round pieces of jade in them. According to Pace and Sheets, this was done for two primary reasons. I bet you know what they are. One, to enhance physical experience and two, to differentiate social status. This too was a practice that was culturally stripped from Mayan people during Spanish conquest. We're gonna hop a little bit forward into 1613 where we start to see teeth modification and alteration in the Philippines. And this signified a rite of passage, mourning a loved one, fostering group identity, or was a means of conforming to a new concept of beauty. Right? And then Father Pedro de San Buenaventura, who was a missionary who was sent to parish in Pila. And during the Spanish colonial period, he wrote Vocabulario de la Lengua Tagala. And the Spanish conquistadors, when they noticed the teeth and the practices that were going on, actually deemed this practice a barbarous practice. And he says in this, in this, um, in this encounter that he wrote, Whoever files his teeth, I will surely punish them. So we start to see this, this trend where this cultural practice, this form of self-expression is, is now being marginalized. It's being stripped from a people because of privilege, because of power, because of new institutions, right? And this doesn't go away with the rise of the U.S. as a world superpower, in the 20th century in Tajikistan, which is a landlocked country in Central Asia, they were once a part of the Soviet Union. We start to see um, gold teeth arise here. Dental care was free here, and gold was the cheapest way to fill and fix a cavity. So it became common, but then it became fashionable. But after the Soviet Union fell and the Tajiks were allowed to leave the country, their value as a status symbol declined. Their teeth no longer represented um, value and social status other places as it did in Tajikistan. So again, we see this switch from culture and institution. These two things are connected. And it's 1970. We start to see gold teeth form um, in New York through hip hop culture. Well, this was carried to New York from the Caribbean and West Indie culture, very much like the Tajiks. West Indians, West Indies were using these to, were using gold to fill and preserve their teeth, right? And then in the 1980s, 1990s, we see Slick Rick, Big Daddy Kane, and Cool G start to flaunt these gold teeth and soon it became a part of hip hop and was something that was a, self, a form of self-expression there. In 1996, Johnny Dang uh, starts to create grills for hip hop culture and it became a way that we reimagined how we lived, right? We were living in segregated and gentrifying America, but it was through gold teeth that became a symbol of power, a sense of self. But with the rise of like white collar practices, gold fronts became a symbol that was associated in mainstream culture as unprofessional. So your question may be, how, what does this have to do with black women in visual storytelling? I'm gonna leave you with these three connections. The first is agency. The agency and cunningness that is exemplified in the diverse and historic narrative of gold teeth it's similar to the way black women have always had to become inventive in the way they cultivated their land, cared for their children, styled their hair. I mean, our hair culture was even preserved in our hair and still is. Inserting rice grains into the braids of our ancestors as they were forced to endure enslavement and the treacherous Middle Passage. As Nikki Giovanni states, 
I turned myself into myself and was Jesus. Black women turned themselves into themselves and created a divinity like none other. The second point is like gold fronts, black women historically and today face censorship in a racist, patriarchal, capitalistic, homophobic, you name it, America, the American black woman is stripped of all that is hers and condemned while others take her cornrows and her nails and her bamboo earrings and deem it as fashionable. But through it all, black women serve as inspiration, not just to herself, but to the greater world. As gold fronts, black women storytellers reveal the divine status of black women in their stories, not just for black women, but for all women. The intersectional power of black women's identities allowed them to create worlds in which we are all liberated. Angela Davis reminds us that our identities do more than impact our interactions with the world. They also impact our beliefs and our ideas, which then impact our institutions. As you watch our Goldfront conversation, I challenge you to think about the ways these artists' choice of subjects and artistic decisions exemplify the judgment of agency, the intentionality of choice Black women use to participate and shape our culture, past, present, and future. Thank you. Enjoy the conversation. All right. Hey, I'm here in this digital land with two creators that I absolutely admire and adore. Welcome to Sophia and Jasmine. Will y'all please introduce yourselves to our, our friends here? My name is please. Sophia Johnson, and I'm a multidisciplinary artist. I'm 22 years old, and I live in Best Eye. Hi guys, I'm Jasmine C. I am a mixed media artist and I reside in Las Vegas, Nevada. Yes, both places have my heart. Um, I currently live in Brooklyn and obviously I am from Las Vegas. A 702 girl for sure. Um, will you both please just, first off, I want to say thank you for joining this conversation. And this event, Gold Front, is specifically to celebrate the influence and agency of Black women in visual storytelling, which you both do so well. And the reason it's called Gold Front is because I've been in awe with just the people's obsession recently with grills. I mean, Issa Rae just did her latest interview with Gail in one, and we stand. I love the fact that, you know, we're able to show up as ourselves and to adorn ourselves the, the way that we want to um because for so long i feel like grills have been connected to the agency and power of men specifically through hip-hop culture right um on a mainstream platform and so i'm glad that we're able to control this imagery um and just wondering first off when would y'all's first kind of encounter with grills or understanding like what they were. Have you ever really even thought about it? I don't think I ever had a moment where I genuinely like registered it. I think it just became a part of what I was digesting all the time and just a part of culture. I never feel like I pointed it out necessarily. Yeah. For me, um, it had to be like when I was growing up in the 90s and my mom she used to always like you know you see images on tv or you see people in the south because in the south that was a thing and it was attractive for people to have gold teeth in their mouth in the south but like my mom she was so disgusted by it and thought it was just so like unattractive and as time progressed i want to say like in the early 2000s when you had like rappers like nelly and paul wall making songs about grills and kind of bringing some like opulence to it, I would say, then it was kind of like, okay, this is kind of cute. It doesn't have to be just the solid gold fronts. It can be, you know, some diamond studs. It can be decorative. So 
I would say like in the 90s. Yeah, I think you hit on a, a point, Jasmine, that I wanted to talk about just a little bit was that it was deemed kind of like ghetto or subordinate to what professionalism was, right? And then to Sophia's point, it's like the culture that we had is what shifted it and took it to a new level. I feel like there is a period of time where it kind of went out. Um, and then now it's like everybody I know has grill. We all walk around like this with your, your pinkies up to your mouth. And I think one, in thinking about this, this Black Art Story Month, um, in your work, like this month, we're focused on democracy, which is voice and power at its root. And I'm wondering, um, I would say both of your pieces, so Sophia's Mother series, Jasmine Mixed Feelings series, are series that adorn Black women in ways that may have been deemed raunchy or associated with these um, caricatures that were developed for us, like this strong Black woman or uh, the Jezebel or the Mammy. I feel like y'all are really pulling out things that used to work or that may in some cases still work for Black women. But wondering what stories do you tell in your work and how are you choosing to adorn or show up in that work? And I, I think like we can we can start with these two that I'm really interested, um, mother and mixed feelings are um, my two favorite to even have parallel with each other and just wondering why y'all chose to show up in these ways. Well, I think like you were saying before with the gold fronts, I think that now we exist in sort of a world and a culture where gold fronts are kind of a they're an elegant piece, they're an elegant accessory. They represent something of divinity to Black people and to our community. And having them sort of just continues to emphasize that. And I think most recently, like I just got around to watching Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, which is kind of embarrassing, but I just got around to watching it. And I was genuinely mesmerized by Viola Davis's gold fronts. And I was like, this is the first time I've actually seen gold fronts that I could picture myself wanting to own. And I think there was a certain simplicity in them that wasn't trying to be seen or like thirsting and it wasn't purely like an egoic thing to wear. It just felt like, I don't know, uh, another thing to emphasize our divinity as Black women. And I think that that's something that, I don't think that my work is inherently trying to be political, but I do think that when I'm working with Black women, it's really important to me that I show them not as victims and show us as people that have our own voice and have our own interests and the things that light us up and the things that we're inspired by. And instead of feeding into this idea that we're victims of oppression and helpless and have no voice and need someone to save us, that we're magical and special in our own way and have so much to say. And I think for so long we've been silenced and especially as artists, we haven't been given the voice or the materials or the mediums to fully express ourselves. And so I'm always sort of keeping in mind the privilege of living in a time where I can create work with Black women that isn't about oppression and that can be about our divinity and um, our realness at the same time. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. What And I feel like Beam does that though, right? This divinity that comes through. Can you talk to us about this piece a little bit? Yeah, so this whole series was actually in and of itself kind of divinely intervened, I believe, because Inevitably, I was asked to take maternity photos of a friend, um, and I prefer to shoot on film because there is that awkward in between where I don't really know how the photos are going to come out, and so I kind of have to just surrender to the process and let them go. And in getting them back, I realized that I accidentally double exposed them with expired film from the Whitney Biannual in 2019. I went and was at the time interning there and was taking pictures primarily of the Black women who were a part of the biannual because it was the most diverse biannual that had happened in a long time. And this one so happened to be double exposed with Stick by Simone Lee, 
um, who's one of my favorite artists for sure. And I don't know, and, and this piece has, her piece in particular has to do with um, fertility and just, it, her main audience is catering to black women. And so I think it was just really interesting that all of my photos of um, my friend ended up being double exposed with all photos from the Whitney Biennial of black women artists. So this is one in particular where that happened and it's unedited. So I haven't tweaked it or anything. This is just exactly how it came out after being in the dark room, so. Divine in its own way of like being birthed for sure. Um, in the way that it decided to show up. Jasmine, I also feel like in this piece for, that you've done, we see that this level of mysterious, like this mystical power. What what were you thinking when you did Crescendo? So Crescendo is a piece from my Mixed Feeling series. And honestly, I was inspired by um, like, like when I was younger, remember those photos you would look at, but you would have to like look at them at a certain angle and you would see something different. I was inspired by those type of photos. Um, and I also wanted to, um, from this mixed feeling series, I end up birthing um, this, this term I call the elevated selfie. And I just wanted to, to change how selfies are. I feel like we're in a time where a lot of people are I guess an era of vanity. I see a lot of selfies mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of not impressed. So I just wanted to like take some selfies of my own and kind of mix it and make it more, um, more visually appealing and, and not so simple. So with this crescendo um, photo, I wanted to keep it simple, but at the same time, make your mind wonder like, oh my God, how did you do this effect? Like, I, you know, this is so simple, but how come I never thought of that? And I don't know, I just, I just wanted to, to elevate my selfie with this. Mm -hmm. I like that we have this kind of through line and this theme of, um, of like, of, of divinity and elevation and going above um, beyond it, because I think when I think about democracy's body, and this might be a loaded question, but thinking about the theme is how it, how is your work democratic? And like understanding de democracy to really be about people, voice, about power. How does that show up in your work, or does it, or do you think it does? For me, yeah, I don't really, um, like Sophia said earlier, like I kind of don't really think about politics, but in the word of democ uh, in the sense of democracy, I feel like I take control of my feelings. Um, I'm, you know, the voice of, I wouldn't say I'm the voice of women, but I feel like the way that I express myself through my art, it could be, you know, a re reflective of other women's, other people's feelings um that may not be in touch with you know their artistic side um just seeing how people have received my work um you know i feel like they they are you know impressed they're able to relate to it um and they're fascinated by it in a way of of um like um i, I guess admiration so as far as uh democracy in my work. I'm the voice of myself. I feel like maybe I may be the voice for some people's emotions as well. And yeah, that's my answer. I agree. I feel like also um, I try to practice that in the projects that I choose to work on and pushing myself to like not only working with Black women, but working with communities that maybe I'm not as immersed in as well and allowing myself to represent an artist that can work with different communities and different cultures and ideas and not uh, pigeonholing myself because I think that that can also happen with black women and with artists in general and black artists in general as well as that we're often put in this box to only create work about black trauma and I think that that is something that isn't fair for black women to have to carry either, like carrying that weight of only having to create that work. 
I think that we should be allowed to tell stories of Black ascension and divinity, but also work with artists who we admire, who may not even look like us, but we just connect with them some weird level of just being a human and having our own authentic interests and things. So I'd say that that's how I practice it within my work. But at the same time, I agree with Jasmine that I'm not trying to push this, uh, my politics on anyone else. And I don't expect anyone to 100% relate to my experience because I think that that, again, pigeonholes us. So, yeah. Yeah, facts. And I think y'all both are talking about to this idea of like one, reimagining to what that even looks like. For me, that's what I'm hearing. It's like, when I think about democracy and even with the show, is this the idea of like reimagining what that looks like from our lens and through our own voice and how that then impacts other people. That in itself is democratic in an institution that pits itself or pits it against us and our identities as black women there's so many intersecting identities that we have um that i think creating the work that you want to create with with whomever you want to create to accentuate the parts of yourself that you want to and the parts of others and to show up how you want is democratic in and of itself um because we live in a space that on so many levels tries to mute and to marginalize that um, and so I think that that also brings me into wondering how or or how has your practice contributed to the storytelling of Black women? And I loved actually both of yours. Your work kind of works so well together. I loved um, Orbit and Mixed Feelings together. And if you see... I just wonder if y'all see what y'all think about that, like orbit and mixed feelings together and this idea of contributing to the stories of Black women. Um, what stories are y'all trying to tell with these images? So this particular portrait here, this is called Happy from uh, my Mixed Feelings series. The the whole point behind this mixed feeling series was for me to take images that I had and kind of transform what they were conveying because there were some pictures that I had that I was actually like my eyes were empty. Um, there was a point in time where I wasn't taking that many photos because I was going through something and I felt like when you looked into my eyes, you could see that. So that's what inspired this whole mixed feeling series. I wanted to mix a whole bunch of images that I had and change um, change what it conveyed to, to the audience. So this particular one, this was called Happy. Um, the, the image that I started with, it was a really good photo. I felt like it was a feel good photo. So I was like, let me see how I can mix this up and just make it more happy or more beautiful or more vibrant um, than what it already was. So yeah, I, I think my work is really about the softness um, and uh, yeah, I'll say the softness of of a woman um, as it pertains to Black women. You know, we're always, uh, or most times, we're conveyed to be strong, independent, and all these things. It's kind of like, did I ask to be that? I didn't. And, you know, my feelings are very important to me. I'm a water sign. I'm a Pisces. So that is like a part of my everyday being. So I wanted to immerse myself in my emotions. How was I feeling? What do I want to convey? What do I want to hide? What do I want to transform? So my um, my standpoint is really about the softness of a black woman. I feel like mine's also very similar. I'm noticing here that it's uh, wrongly captioned in the sense that it's orbit, but it's double exposed with um, Sentinel One by Wangai Shimu too. So these sculptures that are in interfeeding, uh, interrupting the photos um are by Wangai Shimutu who I feel like does I, I'm obsessed with her in the sense that she does this amazing job of representing the strangeness and the weirdness of black women I think that she allows us to be very just like odd and sensual and beautiful and unique in our own way and she does that in this in these sculptures where it's like you can't fully make out that it is a black woman but there's certain features that make you just feel that aura and that essence and I think that 
that kind of inspires me as an artist to how can I um, represent my identity and represent these different facets of my identity in a way that's not unconventional and that's not uh, so obvious. Um, so yeah. Thank y'all so much. What advice would you give to visual storytellers who are looking to establish and move forward with their creative practice in terms of and doing what they want to do? That's what this is about, right? And when you wear your gold fronts, it's about expressing yourself as you want to and showing up as you want to. Um, and so what advice would y'all give to creatives who may be struggling um, with one, either starting or two, with actually showing up as themselves? I would advise to explore all mediums pot as possible. If you feel like you have a story to tell, explore painting, explore writing, explore film, explore whatever mediums you can um, and find what works for you or find what um, is most comfortable for you or what makes your storytelling um, as easeful as possible. And yeah, there's so many stories that have not been told. So I would say keep going, explore as many different mediums as possible and your story is important and it needs to be told. I agree, I would also say that, um, I don't know if I'm necessarily in the position to be giving advice, but I guess something that I'm learning is that um, it's really okay to be, to take time. And, and I think we exist in, a society and especially in the digital age as artists, we feel like we constantly have to output and that puts so much pressure on ourselves to create work all the time. And I think that sometimes the best work, or at least I've learned that the best work comes when I just give myself so much space and time off. And it's in that, that you also transform unknowingly as an artist because you're soaking up all this new information and you're allowing yourself to become a student again. and you're allowing yourself to become malleable and just become a different form of yourself that you weren't before. And I think that that process is so crucial as an artist in general. And so allowing yourself to just give into that is something that's really changed my life. And it's allowed, like Jasmine was saying, for me to find other mediums that I necessarily wouldn't think that I would gravitate towards and finding new passions and ways of expressing myself. So I would say, take your time and don't rush anything. Mm -hmm. That's real. And taking your time too, I feel like is also a way, when I think of democratic, I think about, honestly, maybe this is Scorpio in me, but like just rebel, like pushing back. Like I don't have to be what people say I need to be or do what I need to be. But the only way that you really figure that out is when you are rooted and when you're grounded and you're able to connect to yourself. And I feel like, what I appreciate it so, most about, so much about your work is that you're able to really do that. You're able to sit. There's a reflective component also to the pieces um, that I really ab admire and was wondering too, how do you see yourself specifically for Sophia um, in Mother and talking about drum, right? Drum, it's, it's beautiful to me because it captures kind of the mystical element of the female body. And then as a black woman, to be able to give life on top of all of these other intersecting identities, um, wondering just, did you feel that energy when you were creating that? And, and why an attention solely on like the, the, the belly? I mean, I know she's pregnant, but there's more to that, right? <laughs> right. Um, well, I think motherhood is something that I've always thought about. I think that it's, uh, I've just always felt very fascinated by motherhood and, um, and what it means to be a natural or an unnatural mother and like questioning that and questioning um, just, especially as black women, I've, I've, I've rarely met a black woman that hasn't had this maternal pressure put on her. 
And so I'm mm -hmm. just always wondering what that, uh, questioning that, I guess, and, and wondering how that became so innate. And so I think drum is kind of just talking about how our heartbeat is that innate thing. And the drum is also, you know, the heartbeat of the child uh, within her. And so I think it's sort of trying to connect that. And I think the really interest, the really cool thing about existing in a time like now and creating work is that there are so many women artists who are also questioning the same things. Like lately I've been so inspired by Maggie Gyllenhaal and The Lost Daughter and just how she depicted this woman who would naturally, you would see her because she left her child and see her as a bad mom. And I think that work like that is pushing us to kind of question motherhood and this pressure that we put on ourselves to be perfect all the time and it's just not real so that's a really long-winded answer of why I, why i feel connected to this work right now but that's uh kind of what i've been reflecting on i think if that makes any sense no it makes a lot of sense because what was funny ab about what you said is like this idea of having maternal pressure and having to feel like you have to care for someone else. I have this baby doll theory um, where I, if I'm, if I do become a mother, and I just don't think I want my my children to play with baby dolls, especially my, if I have girls who identify as as female that there is so much pressure at a young age to care for somebody else outside of yourself before you even learn and understand who you are. And exactly. I think it's essential and important for people it, and at such a young age to begin to develop and understand who they are and explore. I'm 30 years old and still exploring who I am. So, you know, to have other outside elements, I think just adds to it and Jasmine, it connects so well to me for, um, I don't know if this was a series or if two of these pieces were called Sustain a Whole, but Bonzi Girl, is it Bonzi Girl? Is that how I pronounce her? It's I Bansy love Girl. This, like, Bansy Girl. I love this image because I feel like, Jasmine, you're a mother yourself, right? I think sometimes when we think of moms, we think of having to be outside of our bodies. When you talk about heartbeat and you have a heartbeat within you, I feel like sometimes mommies are expected to stop and what makes their heart go kind of becomes um, secondary and, and maybe it does, but this image to me was totally counter that. Um, who is she and what is she about? We love her. This is actually a really good friend of mine. Um, her name is Tansy, but I call her Bands. So that's why I named, um, titled this piece Bansy Girl because I call her Bansy. But um, this is actually a piece um, of Tansy. Um, sh the outfit that she has on, she um, is a fashion designer. That's her actual, uh, the dress she designed, that's her outfit. She's actually a mother also. Um, and I, I'm not for sure. I don't know if her, her, her child is non-binary or not, but she actually is a mother. She's a queer mother. She lives in New York. Um, and she's just an artist and I, she's always supported my work and I've always supported her work. So we kind of collaborated together um with this sustain a ho series that's the um name of her clothing line sustain a ho um and i just she just wanted um a way to to express and share her clothing line with other people in a creative artsy way so what i did was you know a lot of her pieces well all of her pieces they're upcycled um she takes old pieces that were used already and she stitches them all together to create a whole new piece like the one in the image and what I wanted to do was to bring that collage aspect out because um, I feel like her clothes are collages. So I just wanted to um, include my collage in there and kind of recreate her face, um, take her eyes away, give her some new lips. And yeah, and just, you know, freak it out. <laughs> Yeah, right. This, see, to me, this is Democrat, right? This is, I'm showing up as I want to, and even the name uh, Sustain the Hall. I mean, you know, we had hotels come out, and that was a whole, we can have a whole nother conversation about hotels, but really just Black women. It's, I'm here for all the Black women to embrace themselves and to put 
how, show up as they want to show up. And so I thank y'all for showing up for us and showing up as yourselves and showing up to inspire us um, and engage us in your beautiful work. And I thank y'all so much. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Sophia, I actually really like drum. Let's talk about drum because I like that one a lot. I mean, I like well, all the we... drum really like. Talk about huh? it on here. Talk about it on here. No, when I was looking at the image, I so I so I have a son, he's four, um, and I had a natural birth and I had a black midwife. That was extremely important to me when I delivered my baby into the world. Mm -hmm. Like just always the image, the images that we see in film and just everywhere. You're always seeing this woman in the hospital stuck to this bed. And I've gone to two um two deliveries before I had my son. I've I had saw my cousin deliver her daughter and then one of my really good girlfriends Nadia she delivered her son and I was in the, the delivery room with both of them and I just didn't like how oppressive it felt so when I had my child I was like oh we're not doing that I need my freedom to eat what I want to get up when I want and I want to be around black a black woman because I know I'm going to be safe with a black woman so um I chose a midwife. Her name's Debbie Allen. She's in LA. But when I saw this photo, I was like, oh my God, I would love to gift this to my midwife, Debbie, um, because it just would look perfect in her office. She's, she's, she's the bomb. She's the real deal. She, I feel like she's the best midwife in the world. But when I saw this image drum, I was like, oh, Debbie would love this and she would love to hang this in her office. So that's why I was like, oh yeah, let's talk about this. Cause I might, I might want this. <laughs> let's talk. <laughs> That's amazing, yes. though, that you have such a positive experience because I feel like that's another, that's a whole other conversation. But Black women's maternity experiences are not what they should be at all. Um, I'm so sorry, <laughs> Snow. Um, but they're not at all what they should be. And it's, it's a problem, but um, I'm so happy that you had a good experience and that you had a Black doula. That's amazing. Can we talk about for one second, though, feeling safe with black women and what that means? And why do we why do we feel safe with black women? Why is that? Yeah, why? For me, um, I see a reflection of myself. Um, I see, you know, people that are going to look out for me. I feel like when I see other black women and specific black women I can think of, I feel like when they look at me, they see themselves in me. I, and, and I'll say that with the older black women. I feel like they'll look at me and they're like, oh, she reminds me of a younger version of myself. So let me look out for her. Let me, you know, give her the game. Let me, you know, tell her how to avoid the missteps that I made. And I'm so appreciative for all the black women in my life that have done that and that continue to do that. So, yeah, it's kind of like a, a nurturing feeling. It's like a tribal feeling. It's a community feeling. And it's like... You know, if nobody's going to look out for you, it's going to be somebody that looks like you and somebody that, you know, wants you to thrive and show up and continue doing the work that we just have inherently have to do. So, yeah, I, I, I love being I love black women. I love, you know, communing with them. And yeah, I feel safe with black women. Yeah, I literally couldn't say it any better. I feel the exact same way. The exact same way. I mean, it's um, it's rare that I've sort of come into a community of Black women and haven't felt safe and inherently seen. And I think that that's another part is that there. I don't feel like I have to like beg to be seen or anything or, or prove myself. I feel very safe to be seen as I am, and that's rare. So yeah. Yo, know, it's because I feel like Black, black women. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I go feel ahead. Like black women are genuinely like good at making everybody feel seen, to be honest. And it's not just because, you know, okay, like we look alike, but I feel like we make older white men that make it challenging for us. We can make them feel seen. It's just natural. We want love. We want care. We want everybody to get along and we want things to be easeful for us. Um, I think that's just something naturally that black women do for everybody. And I wonder if that's also because we exist in this intersection where we're constantly having to like deal with all these different energies and these different identities 
And so we know how to communicate with like all of them. And I think that that's a very powerful thing about being a black woman that is often overlooked is that we can be this bridge between cultures and, and genders and however you identify. But at the same time, we bear that weight of when are we going to be seen for the entirety of what we contribute. Yeah. I always call it like the unicorn effect because unicorns, you don't see them. People know that, you know, we know that they're out there and they're these mystical creatures, but I'd be like, yo, well, can they see us? But I feel that that's what black women are because we exist at all of these intersections um, and we live in a society that is rooted in those intersections. Um, and oftentimes, overlook that we're able to see a perspective that nobody else has and that nobody else can 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 uh, speak to um which i absolutely love and it actually reminded me that unicorn effect reminded me i thought we was gonna wrap up but it reminded me of up late jasmine um up late because of her eyes like i was like yo this is the unicorn effect um, the eyes that you you did in that piece are so bold and so big. And I feel like with the candles that are lit, it kind of just reminded me of the, you know, I've been working on my chakra system of like the third eye chakra and this awakening. Um, what was what was it like creating this piece? Man, this image is so me and so probably so many other women. This image is just a night, a late night at home by yourself. You got the candles burning. You got, you know, the scents going. You got the R&B playing. Like you see the records at the top. The lights are dim. And, you know, you got maybe your flowers or whatever it is. And you got your journal, which you see the, the paper um, cuts in the bottom. This is just how I find, how I center myself. This is how I feel good. This is how I reset, this is how I recharge. This is like, this image is like the perfect night for me. Um, and yeah, I think a lot of, of women have these nights. And yeah, that's what this uplight, this uplight image was inspired by. Um, I feel like even with the eyes, like, I kind of want, I was covering my own eyes because I just wanted to bring up, bring it to a different chin, but I still wanted to be sensual and still wanted it to be sexy. Like I got on my silk dress and yes, this, I love this, this photo so much because it's just a reflection of me and like that, that late night when I'm having an R&B vibe um, and I'm playing my music and I got my candles burning. And it's very 90s too. I'm like, is it named after Up Late by Ari Lennox? <laughs> oh, it's named after that song. <laughs> it <Okay>. is. <laughs> we Wait, love. What'd you say? It's up. It's after Up Late by Ari Lennox. Yeah, we yeah. love. We, we love. love Ari. We <laughs> to that point. She will bring you to that point for real. I think that's also important too, though, and why Black women are our goal fronts is because though we take care of every and are really sometimes forced to take care of everybody else, you still can show up as yourself and still wind down and tune in to those things that are gonna refuel and recharge you. And so I think like, as we close, I wanna just leave all the black women who are listening out there to that, is that show up as you, you are the prize, you are the shiny gold front that exists, right? And you can adorn and decorate yourself however you choose to please and show up in this world however you choose to please because it is you, you are it. Um, and so, you know, cut on your music, light your candles, getting your silk um because you, you are definitely the the, the prize so thank y'all for joining us it's been great to talk with y'all i feel like we just getting started but you know we got to, we got things to do thank y'all so much thank you thank y'all so much for joining this conversation of gold fronts and I am so thankful and grateful that I got to sit down with Sophia Johnson and Jasmine C. Thank you both for sitting and having this conversation with us. So many things came up 
about what it means to be a Black woman artist and to take control of your own narratives and what it means to show up as you want to show up. Um, I encourage all of our viewers out there to embrace your goal fronts, right? Embrace who you are, to show up authentic authentically, whether that's um, in, in a boardroom or in your creative practice or both. How about them both, right? And so I thank you so much. Thank you, Brick. Thank you, Myrtle Ave Brooklyn Partnerships. And if you haven't, please check out the mural walk on Myrtle Avenue and have a good one. Thank you.